Welcome to the National Geological Repository, part of the British Geological Survey. And I'm your guide, Mike Howe, Chief Curator. So, the British Geological Survey, or BGS, houses the largest collection of UK geoscience samples. Most of those are held at our main headquarters site in Keyworth. So location wise, for those not familiar, uh, Keyworth is midway kind of between Derby, Nottingham and Leicester in the English Midlands. And this is what the site looks like. It was originally built in the 1960s as a teacher training college and the survey moved there in the 1970s and has built on extensively. The bits of the site we're going to visit today include the core store, the core viewing area, the petrology and biostratigraphy collections, the type and reference fossils. This is a major collection of a quarter of a million good examples of all the UK macrofossils and it includes about 30,000 type figured and sighted fossils. We also have major collections of rock thin sections and microfossils. We have a dedicated store purpose built for radioactive minerals. And of course, to keep tracks on all these, we have our archives and uh, record stores. So this is where we're going to visit. Um, and We'll go through the data and samples holdings in more detail, but we're going to be talking about a lot of borehole material because, of course, we're a national geological repository, which means we hold material of commercial interest, borehole material in particular, as well as sort of more normal collections like rocks, fossils, minerals, and so forth. And of course, we have major records collections a 17 and a half kilometers of shelving and the digital data collections, well, that grows so quickly, we must be talking about petabytes probably by now. Brief bit of history. Well, the survey was founded in 1835 and put on a more legal footing in 1845 by the Geological Survey Act. And this gave survey officers the right to enter any property in the UK and to take samples for the purpose of making geological maps. Subsequently, a variety of uh, minerals acts, petroleum acts, water acts, also give us the right either to receive samples and borehole and well logs at our premises or to visit sites and to take samples. The survey set up its first museum, the Museum of Economic Geology, in 1837, shortly after the founding of the survey. And within a few years, it was full. So they uh, found a plot in, uh, uh, ran from German Street through to Piccadilly in London, and over a period of time built the Museum of Practical Geology. And as you can see here, all the crown jewels were on display. This is the museum that Lyle and Darwin used to meet uh, as they were walking around the galleries. Unfortunately, in the 1920s, the roof panels, glass panels started to fall in, probably due to subsidence, might've been World War I Zeppelin bomb damage or uh, subsidence due to the weight of rocks. So they found a plot adjacent to the Natural History Museum in South Kensington and built what's now known or was known as the Geological Museum there. And the contents were transferred in 1935. But then as part of the general move of civil servants out of London, um, the contents uh, of the Geological Museum were moved up to Keyworth in 1985 and additional collections held in Newcastle, Aberystwyth, Exeter, and material, some material held in uh, Edinburgh have subsequently been transferred uh, to the Keyworth site. So we'll go through the collections in a bit more detail and starting with the borehole and oil well collections. 
And this is uh, where we hold the material. We have a series of three core storage halls. They're all interconnected and all the material is stored on pallets, caged pallets on racking, accessed using forklift trucks. So here we see a narrow aisle man up forklift. This collects the pallets from the racking and drops it to the floor where an ordinary forklift will take it through to the examination area. Our aim is to minimize the amount of manual handling. So here he will have a picking list. He has selected the pallet from its location and it's simply a case of retrieving it and dropping it down to the floor. Notice that every box is barcoded, every pallet's actually barcoded, every location is barcoded, and we do all the movements tracking and auditing uh, simply by swiping barcodes. Uh, the latest store that holds the UK continental shelf hydrocarbon material, well, the only way we could fit it in was to go to mobile racking. So each of these racks weighs about a bit under a thousand tons, about the same weight as a fully laden passenger train. And the uh, technician will check that the aisle is empty and press the button. And then when the uh, lights come on on the individual uh, racks, presses the one for the aisle he wishes to open up. And then a forklift is used in the same way to retrieve the required pallet. So to give you an idea of the scope of the collections, as I said, there's onshore borehole material, 15,000 boreholes, over 200 kilometers of drill core. There's the UK continental shelf or offshore hydrocarbon collection. Uh, that's uh, 290 kilometers, probably 300 kilometers of core from excess of 6,700 wells. And the UK continental shelf marine but non-hydrocarbon collection. This includes seabed samples, gravity cores, fiber cores, and some shallow boreholes. This is what the collection looks like. So the older material um, that was uh, curated in London was broken up into individual hand specimens, each numbered, and we have the records with the depths, the boreholes, a list of the fossils identified, and of course, a description of the uh, petrography. But when we established an office in Leeds in the 1960s, they leased an old engine shed for storage, and that had sufficient space to hold meter long sticks of core. And this is now our preferred way of storing material. And of course, in hydrocarbon wells, because uh, price is critical and the operators tend to core reservoirs, they're not so interested in the rocks between, um, they tend to use a bit that grinds it all up into rock fragments. These are washed up to the surface and then um, bagged and sent to the lab for cleaning, washing and drying. And this is what we know as washed and dried cuttings. Here's some examples of cores. And here we see an aquifer. And this is a hydrocarbon reservoir. Notice the plugs have been taken to check porosity and permeability, because if it's going to be a useful reservoir, it has to be porous. You have to have the spaces to hold the oil and the pores have to join up so that it has to be permeable so that you can get the oil out. And here is an example of a three meter thick coal seam uh, with the leached um, sandstones, in fact, above and below, known as ganister. For every borehole we have, we do of course have detailed logs and many of these are publicly available. And here we see boreholes in action being studied. We have five study laboratories. Here as a group of students are being trained in working with borehole material. And uh, here, this is material laid out for research work. 
This is some of the older material from a Jurassic borehole. And as you'll see in the trays on the right, um, again, this was broken up and the particularly interesting uh, samples with uh, useful fossils were retained. Of course, we have all the depth and uh, ID information for them. About a million specimens in total. Then we go on to the biostratigraphy and paleontology collections. We use the term biostratigraphy because of course as a survey, one of our main jobs is making maps and they're colored to show the age. So we tend to use fossils more for their uh, stratigraphy, biostratigraphy than we do uh, for study purely as organisms. Although of course, many of our visitors are purely interested in their study as organisms or plants. So to give you an idea of our petrology and paleo collections, um, paleo ones tend to be more concentrated, of course, where you would expect in England and Wales. Petrology is more concentrated in Scotland, where there's a greater variety of rock types. And geochemistry is really fairly well spread across the country, but again, a lot in Scotland and Wales and the Southwest, which are areas of interest to mining. The main reference fossil collection, this is a quarter of a million samples and 30,000 type are kept in uh, wooden cabinets. And these are what they look like. They have notice um, glass topped um, lids to each drawer, tight fitting. And when we put humidity and temperature monitors in, it's almost flat line. These are ideal conditions for uh, preserving fossils in. And all these with the blue uh, tags are type figured or cited material. As well as the uh, museum specimens in drawers, we are also involved in one or two larger projects. And this is an example of 140 square meters of bedding plane that we molded in silicon rubber in Charnwood Forest. Um, this is an area with uh, a really famous Ediacaran biota difficult to study in the field, but by taking the casts and lighting them properly, we could see something like a thousand times more individual fossils than you could see on the bedding plane in the quarry. And this has formed the basis of a number of PhDs um, at a number of universities in the UK. The mineralogy and petrology collections, well, most of the minerals from the Museum of Practical Geology were actually left with the Natural History Museum when the survey moved to Keyworth. But we have since um, taken into care the collections of the Royal Geological Society of Cornwall. And these include some uh, very excellent mineral samples. We also have uh, some Darwin samples that were actually donated by Charles Darwin to the Museum of Practical Geology. And ours, we're pleased, still have the original Darwin numbers on. So 797, it's actually yellow. So it corresponds to 3,797, which is an Ascension Island specimen he collected when on his way home. In addition to the, the main petrology collections, we also have a specialist radioactive minerals collection and this is housed in a purpose-built area um, and it forms effectively a, a center of excellence in the UK. Also in the hazardous minerals, we have a large collection of asbestos minerals and these are all suitably and securely stored. And again, this is a unique collection in the UK. So of course, with all these physical samples, uh, keeping track of the records of accessions and details, citations is important. And uh, we keep uh, all our registers and records up in one of our main records room. Across the organization, we have something like 10, total of 17 and a half uh, kilometers of shelving of records. And um, this is um, a one in, main one in Keyworth. So on the left, we've just passed some hanging racks of maps. 
We're now coming on to see the Argonite cylinders for fire suppression system. And then we come through to the roller racking where the, the main records are kept. And in the um, shelving on the left and the right, uh, we have um, a variety of borehole records, hydrocarbon records, um, site investigations, records from Nirex, which was a project looking for safe storage of radioactive waste, a whole series of onshore borehole records, series of marine records, coal authority records. And here we come to the paleo registers, just under a thousand registers. Uh, next to it is the petrology registers. And finally, on the right hand side here, we have the main fire safe where we hold all the early field notebooks and maps of the survey geologists. They've all been scanned, but of course it's important to safeguard um, the actual records. So um, with all these collections, how do we make them available other than by visiting uh, Keyworth? Well, we've been at the forefront of digitizing and databasing, providing online access to our collections. And all the main collections have searchable metadata databases online. So this is for the UK continental shelf uh, hydrocarbon wells. You can um, search for, you put in a, a well name or an operator, and it will take you through, tell you this, show you the samples we hold. And if you click on the core, it will show you thumbnails of high resolution photographs. So we've been looking at a, working with a lot of our physical collections to make effectively digital surrogates, digital proxies. And many of those are high resolution images. And our high resolution core images, they're so high resolution that I can see more detail in the images than I can in the core itself without using a hand lens. If you printed them off size for size, and these are meter sticks of core, you're printing at something over 200 dots to the inch. So these are high resolution. And they were all photographed under standard lighting with um, rulers and with color cards. So you can actually do quite a lot um, of analysis from the images and they're being particularly uh, interest now that AI is gaining traction. But we actually took these photographs using a conveyor system and this was set up in 2010 and was probably one of the first conveyor systems for imaging geological specimens. Everything, including the camera, was controlled by barcode and it enabled us to do 100% audit of the collection at the same time. As well as high resolution images of core, we have uh, photographed 160,000 rock thin sections. So these are thin 30 micron thick slices of rock on microscope slides and they're photographed either plain or between cross polars and the so-called birefringence, the false colors produced between cross polars, help you analyze and identify the minerals. And all these data are also available through our GIS system, GeoIndex. So you can select the data set you want. And here we have rock samples, and if you click on one of those points, it will take you through to the detailed metadata database for that sample and thumbnails for the thin section images. And these are what they, they look like. So that's plain polars and that's cross polars. We've also been involved, we were lead partners in a GB3D type fossils project, aiming to re-photograph as many as possible of UK type macro fossils and um, these are now all up the 17 and a half thousand and they are all available search via this case you can see the thumbnails and as well as high resolution images which actually show you so much detail you can even see the dust we should have cleaned off before we photograph them 
but we also did stereo pairs. So if you've got um, red, blue glasses, uh, you can see this as a uh, full stereo. In addition, 2000 of the best specimens, we laser scanned to produce 3D digital models. And these two are all downloadable from the website. And uh, since it was launched back in uh, 2013, use has actually grown and grown and continues to grow and has been particularly important uh, during the lockdown with a number of universities using the for practicals. And the future, well, we've just invested in a core scanning facility. So instead of taking physical samples off core, it's now possible to CT scan it and to do plots of um, geochemistry via XRF. And this scanner here measures a number of parameters such as P-wave velocity, natural uh, gamma, gamma density, parameters that enable you to correlate a stick of core with the wireline logs for the well in question. So this we see as the future really, as it removes the need for some of the subsampling. But subsampling is important and our borehole collection is designed for subsampling. And we have a system as we don't know when the samples are taken, exactly what we're going to get back. So our users drop a barcode in and that's then linked to the data when it's returned. And it is a condition of any subsampling of that uh, raw data and any papers or interpretive reports are promptly lodged with us. And we make these available through our website, uh, Deposited Data Search. So if you search for particular well samples, you get uh, a long list. And if the data is available and non-confidential, you can actually download a copy. So where's the future going? Well, as we see it, um, we have our databases, but clearly the future is in data aggregation with the international databases. At the moment, our view is that petrology collections, um, the natural um, aim is uh, international geosample numbers, and we are now the UK issuing agents for IGSNs. Paleo databases, biostratigraphy, paleontology. Well, uh, we've, we're partners in the, we're involved in the Chinese geobiodiversity database. Um, but of course, there's IDIG Bio, GBIF, but we're also particularly keen on GeoCase, the European uh, collections portal. And how do these look? Well, we think in the future, we're probably going to largely use IGSNs and may well be GeoCase if the GeoCase turns is um, going to be critical in the development of the EU and the UK DISCO project. But at the moment, uh, I guess the more the merrier. So we're quite happy to look at exporting our data to GBIF and a variety of suitable aggregating databases. But I need to stress that, of course, we monitor the usage on the databases carefully and we do need that sort of data back because we have to prove to our funders just how used useful and important our collections are. Um, one of the reasons we like IGSNs is they are set up to hold a, a hierarchy. So we have a subsample here, for example, which relates to an individual box of core, which is part of a core run, part of a whole borehole. So you have this parent, daughter and sibling relationships, which is critical in um, establishing how samples and subsamples relate to each other. So in conclusion, well, the National Geological Repository collections is the largest collection of UK geoscience samples. And it's okay, not as big as the Natural History Museum collections, but then they cover the whole world, whereas ours are pretty much UK, particularly Britain. But we do of course have as part of the repository, the drill core, 
and uh, the borehole and the well samples, which is, is unique to ourselves. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>